grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. We join together in our opening prayer. Loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to praise you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude, and to listen to your word with eagerness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we come before God in worship, we recognise our shortcomings. And so we begin with a time of confession, remembering the law of love that we're commanded to follow. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. And so we hold a short silence as we come before God in prayer. And we pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And we join together in the collect prayer for today. Gracious Father, revive your church in our day and make her holy, strong and faithful for your glory's sake, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we come now to learn from God's word, I'm inviting Mary to come and read the Bible readings for today. The first reading is from Judges, chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the lands of the Hittites to the great sea in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall be successful. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The second reading is from Joshua, chapter 2, verses 6 to 19. 
When Joshua dismissed the people, the Israelites all went to their own inheritances, inheritances to take possession of the land. The people worshipped the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. So they buried him within the bounds of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the Kale country Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Moreover, that whole generation was gathered to their ancestors, and another generation grew up after them, who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and worshipped the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them and bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and worshipped Baal and the Astartes. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them and he sold them into the power of their enemies all around so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them to bring misfortune, as the Lord had warned them and sworn to them, and they were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the power of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen even to their judges, for they lusted after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their ancestors had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord. They did not follow their example. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord would be moved to pity by their groaning because of those who had persecuted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they would relapse and behave worse than their ancestors, following other gods, worshipping them and bowing down to them. They would not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mary. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we come now to study your word, would you enlighten our minds and hearts through the power of your spirit at work within us, that we might see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. Amen. I thought it would be good a few weeks in to just begin with a recap of the big story and where we're up to in that in our journey through the Bible. So a few weeks back, we began with creation, where everything that God had made was good and with humanity made in God's image and called to partner with him in ruling the earth. Created in love, humans were given the dignity of free will and there was a real possibility of choice about how they would respond, symbolised in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were deceived into questioning God's goodness and tempted by the thought of having power for themselves. And so they went their own way, consequently had to leave the garden, God's kingdom, to make their own way on earth. But God didn't abandon them. He still clothed them and was present with them. But under their control, things spiralled quickly out of control with all sorts of violence and evil, leading to God washing it all away in the story of the flood, apart from Noah's family, and then scattering the nations away from the Tower of Babel. Those early stories are something like the prehistory, the world setting, into which God then stepped in a more specific way, calling one man, Abraham and his wife Sarah, to trust him enough to leave their land and family, promising to bless them with a new land and multiple descendants so that they would become God's people who would model his ways and be a blessing to the world. Abraham did indeed trust God and was commended for his faith, but the whole family were a pretty mixed up bunch. There were many stories of deceit and betrayal, including Joseph sold by his brothers into slavery. 
And their chapter of the story ended with famine in the land, causing them to go to Egypt, where over time they became slaves themselves, oppressed by the Egyptians, multiplied in numbers, but yet not yet with land or freedom. And that all happened in very loose numbers around 2000 BC. And about 500 years later, we then get the story of Moses and the exodus that Emily shared last week. It was God's dramatic intervention to rescue his people from slavery and establish them as a nation in a land of their own, as he had promised to Abraham. It was no quick journey, and it certainly wasn't easy. They were a very stubborn lot, and God despaired of them many times, and yet ultimately always remained faithful. And eventually, after a whole generation of wandering in the wilderness, it seemed as if they were ready to trust him. As they stood on the verge of entering the new land, they committed themselves with Moses to live as his people and obey his commandments. And that brings us then to this week and to Joshua. In our first reading, we heard how God commissioned Joshua to lead the people into the land, so now fulfilling the promise to Moses and to Abraham before him. Repeatedly, you probably noticed, God tells Joshua to be strong and courageous with reminders that God will be with him and that he should remain faithful and obedient. That theme of faithful obedience with courageous trust runs throughout the book. Joshua leads the people into the promised land and little by little they do take it over, not by their own strength and might, but through courageous trust and obedience to God who seemingly hands cities over to them and leads them to victory even when numbers are clearly stacked against them. The famous Battle of Jericho is a good example where it's trumpet blasts and shouts that bring the walls tumbling down. And by the end of the book, the land is divided between the 12 tribes of Israel. And Joshua, rather like Moses, calls the leaders together and asks, who will you serve? The Lord, the God of Israel, or the foreign gods of these people around you? And they all say, the Lord our God we will serve, and him we will obey. But as we heard in our second reading from the book of Judges, that didn't last long. We're going to come to that in a moment. Before we leave the book of Joshua, I want to acknowledge some of the difficult questions it raises about warfare and about the nature of God and particularly the ethics of holy war. Wiping out whole cities, claiming the land as their own seems unjust. And God is recorded in some cases as commanding that there should be complete annihilation of all living things. So how do we reconcile all this with a God of steadfast love and Jesus' command that we should love our enemies? I don't have easy answers. And I think it's right that we should point out what seems evil and question it. But I also think there are some things that can help us to reconcile some of the tension we may feel. Firstly, it does help to put this bit of Israel's history into the bigger context of the whole story that we're exploring, going through creation through to new creation, and to remember the years upon years of God patiently and graciously working with people that surround this period. In the bigger picture, we see how God is incredibly patient and faithful and loving, not only to Israel, but through them wanting to save all peoples. At this particular time, it seems as if a decisive, violent action is needed in order to fulfil this plan and establish the people within their own land so that they could be a holy nation, God's people, then being a blessing to the whole world. But what about the Canaanites and the others who were living there? Well, again, I don't want to give simplistic answers, but there was some history. These tribes are mentioned in earlier altercations back in Genesis. And in Genesis 15, God interestingly says to Abraham, in effect, that it will be dealt with in the future because their sins are not yet complete. It seems as if he was kind of holding off judgment and it's only come after 400 years of sinful behaviour, presumably with the opportunity to turn to God, as indeed we see in other stories at that time. There's Rahab, the prostitute who helps the Israelites and is rescued from Jericho. 
there's another tribe who turn to the God of the Israelites and are allowed to make a treaty with them. And then there's Ruth, an outsider who gets a whole book to herself, who I'll talk about in a moment. So it's not that God excludes people, but that sin and particularly false worship at this critical time of establishing a new nation has to be dealt with. The Canaanites worshipped the Baals with child sacrifice and ritualised prostitution. Theirs was quite a violent culture. Their gods were tribal in that ancient world, linked to the land and to their people. So in effect, if you won a battle, it proved your god was stronger. So also, perhaps in some ways, it's as if God is speaking their language, demonstrating that he is the one true and powerful god. The Israelites did gain a fearful reputation, not so much for their military might, but because of their mighty god. It should also be noted that in literary terms, there is almost certainly exaggeration employed. That was common in ancient writings of the time. And as the Book of Judges reports, many of the tribes were not annihilated and did in fact remain. And sadly, that contributed to the downfall of the Israelites, which we'll see as we turn to Judges now. So then in our second reading, we hear how after the generation of Joshua died out, another generation grew up who abandoned God and instead worshipped the Baals, the gods of their neighbours. And the reading outlined what's a cycle that then repeats throughout the book. The people abandon God and worship the Baals or other gods. He allows things to run their course, so he gives them over into the hands of their enemies. They then cry to him for help. And God, in his mercy and compassion, raises a leader called a judge, not like a legal judge, more like a sort of tribal chieftain, through whom God delivers them from their enemies. However, they're still not really listening or following God. And as soon as the judge dies, things get even worse. And so the cycle continues. The judges themselves are a funny bunch. The most famous ones you may have heard of are Gideon and Samson. As we've noted before, none of the Bible heroes are perfect, but this lot really do seem particularly flawed, which is perhaps an indication of the age in which they are living. I would say this is the darkest chapter of Israel's history. The book of Judges is not for the faint-hearted. It's full of violence, oppression and sexual immorality. It really is horrific in places. And there's a repeated phrase towards the end of the book that says, In those days there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. And the irony is that, of course, there was a king in Israel. God himself was their king. But they abandoned him and did what they wanted. And yet, even amidst this darkest time, There is still a light of hope and of God at work in the ordinary things of life. The short book of Ruth that follows after tells a simple story of loyalty and faithful love through which God brings about the next stage of the bigger story. It happens within the time of the judges that a woman called Naomi, when famine comes, leaves Israel with her husband and two sons in search of food. They settle in Moab and her sons marry Moabite women, one of whom is Ruth. Sadly, Naomi's husband and later both her sons die, and Naomi, hearing that now there's food again in Israel, decides to return. Presumably she was hoping she may find help from relatives there. Her daughters-in-law, as would be expected, say that they will go with her, but in kindness she urges them to stay, saying that there is nothing for them in Israel. But Ruth insists famously saying, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. And when they get to Israel, Ruth goes to glean in the fields, picking up the scraps. And, well, I would say by divine providence, she meets Boaz, who is a relative and a faithful Israelite. Thank goodness there were still some about in the land. And he lived by the God's laws of kindness and welcome to the stranger. In time, Ruth and Boaz marry and have children, who have children, who have children, and one of whom is King David. 
And so begins the next episode of the big story that we will hear about next week. So with all this talk of warfare and rather dark times in the Bible, it's made me remember those who live with violence and the dark times of today. And so I thought it would be good to sing a hymn that asks for God's healing in our world. And so we're going to remain seated now to sing for the healing of the nations. <laughs> 